we are beginning a new sermon series today called Jesus at the Center, looking at the Apostle Paul's letter to the Colossians. And we're looking at chapter one today, and if you want to grab one of the blue Bibles, it's on page 1192, that's page 1192. At the point of uh, writing the letter to the Colossians, the church there in Colossae is about five years old. It had been begun by uh, someone called Epaphras, and Paul is most probably writing this letter whilst he himself is in chains in prison in Ephesus. So why is he writing this letter to the Colossians? Well, in uh, verse 28 of chapter 1, he tells us, it's so that he might present everyone mature in Christ. Not some people, but everyone. Not everyone just saved, but everyone mature in Christ. And that can be uh, our prayer and our expectation as we work through this series, that God can help us mature in Christ Jesus. So we're going to uh, begin with uh, verse 9. And um, just a few verses of context. Here in uh, verse 9, Paul is reporting to the Colossians a prayer that he's been praying for them. So let's read this together. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will. By God's will here, it means uh, knowledge of the full saving purposes in Christ Jesus. In other words, knowledge of Jesus himself. Paul is praying that they would know God better. Because God's will is a relationship, not a to-do list. And then he continues in verse 10. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. So he's saying, I'm praying that you'd know God better so that you can live holy lives. Verse 11, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. He's saying, to live these holy lives, you can't do it in your own strength. You need God's power, the power of his Holy Spirit in you. And verse 12, so that you can uh, have patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father. So uh, as a summary, to set the context, Paul's saying, I've been praying for you. And my prayer is this that you'd know God better, live holy lives, not in your own power, but in the power of his spirit, and joyfully give thanks. Sound good? I don't know about you, but I'd love somebody to pray that for me. And then throughout the rest of these verses that we're going to read together, Paul then explains what it is and who it is they are to be thankful for. And in so doing, he places his finger upon that which will bring about maturity in Christ for the Colossians. Okay, so let's now read together from verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. 
And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant." So what is it that Paul says will lead to this maturity in Christ? Well, the most important thing he says in all of those verses is that we must acknowledge the total and utter supremacy of Jesus Christ. Those five verses from verse 15 to 20, Paul writes what is believed to be a poem of the early church that is a sort of CV for Jesus. It says he is the image of the invisible God. All things were created by him, through him, for him. He's before all things, pre-existent, and holds all things together. He's the head of the church. He's the firstborn amongst the dead from the resurrection. He's supreme in everything. All the fullness of God dwells in him, and through him and his death on the cross, God has reconciled all things to himself. Wow. Now that is a CV. I don't care how good your CV might be, and I'm sure it's very impressive. That is the ultimate resume in the universe. And Paul says, it is this supreme Jesus, this very same Jesus that loves you and me and lives in us by his Holy Spirit. And when we put it like that, it seems quite frankly ridiculous to think or behave like we need anything more. I remember Sarah and I, we needed to go out in our car and um, we went to the little pot in the kitchen where we keep our keys and the car key wasn't there. So we looked all around the house and we, we couldn't find the keys. So we thought, oh no, last time we were out in the car and we parked it, we must have dropped the key between the car and our front door. So we went outside to look for it, and it was nighttime by now, and there were no lights on that particular part of the street, and it was pitch black, so we went and got a torch, and we started to literally comb the ground between the car and our house. And then we got on our all fours, and we started to look all around. We spent 40 minutes literally on our hands and knees, trying to find this key that we must have dropped. And we couldn't find it. It was so frustrating. The car was there, but we couldn't drive it. So we eventually went back into the house, despondent. And I thought, I I just can't, but I can't believe. Well, how am I going to tell Sarah? <laughs> I'd had the key on me all along and not realized it. And Paul is saying to the Colossians, you already have the key to fullness in life. He's trying to explain to them precisely what it was that happened to them when they came to Christ. He's trying to explain what it means to be in Christ, a phrase Paul will use 86 times throughout his letters in the New Testament. 
He's trying to say to them, I, I don't know whether you can relate to this. I know I certainly can. He's trying to say to them, you don't need to endlessly search for fullness and meaning and purpose in life. You don't need to endlessly search to try and deepen your faith. You already have everything that you need. And the key is Jesus. Simply Jesus. But the problem was the Colossians, although only five years into their faith, had begun to uh, forget their first love. That's why in chapter two, he'll compare them to the believers in Laodicea who struggled in the same way. Their faith in Colossae had become, you could say, Jesus plus. Jesus plus additional beliefs or Jesus plus additional practices. Now, what were they? Well, some think they were Jesus plus uh, works, rules and regulations, the influence of Judaizing believers. That's why in chapter two, he'll talk about their rules and regulations. Others say, no, the issue was Jesus plus false worship. That's why later in the letter, he'll talk about the worship of angels. Others say, no, 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 it was uh, Jesus plus false thinking, a sort of pre-Gnostic Gnosticism. That's why he'll talk about deceptive philosophies later in the letter. Now, whatever the issue was, it was Jesus plus. But the problem is that when we add things to Jesus, we don't add to our faith, we actually diminish it. Jesus plus always equals Jesus minus. And it's so easy to do, isn't it? Our confidence can slip into, I don't know, it might be Jesus plus our income, or Jesus plus our grades, or uh, Jesus plus that relationship, or Jesus plus maybe even our spiritual disciplines. Now these are all really good things, but Paul here is saying, How central is Jesus really to our lives? Is he actually completely supreme? Because a false focus often doesn't deny Jesus, it dethrones him. It doesn't take away his prominence, it denies his preeminence. It says Jesus is a way, not Jesus is the way. Paul is saying Jesus is not a supplement, nor is he to be supplemented. Jesus is our saviour, and he alone is always enough. The supremacy of Christ. And then Paul says... Once we've grasped how Jesus is completely supreme, then we begin to realize a couple of things that he does in our lives that brings us to maturity in him. And one of those things is this. We realize that Jesus has brought us a new exodus. What does that mean? Well, verse 13, Paul writes, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Now this imagery of being transferred from one kingdom to another would have immediately evoked the memory of God's people being rescued from slavery in Egypt and brought into the promised land. And the promised land is now a person, Jesus. And uh, the kingdom is his The kingdom we are in now is the kingdom of the son he loves. That's a a reference to Jesus' baptism where the father said, this is my son whom I love. And when God brings us into the kingdom of Jesus, what that means in our lives is that we get a new found freedom. I want to ask you today, Do you feel free? 
because that's precisely what you are, what we are. We are free. Are you walking out into that freedom? I remember a, a while back I was taking a flight and you know, I'm one of those people that I never get an upgrade. <laughs> it doesn't matter how smartly I, I dress or how sweetly I smile at the check-in, I never get an upgrade. And this one time they said to me a question that, if I'm really honest, is a daft question, it doesn't need answering. It was this, sir, would you like an upgrade? Yes, please. And they said, and you can use the business lounge. I thought, I have made it. <laughs> so this was a new experience to me. I went to the business lounge. I showed them the ticket. And they said, OK, sir, you just get in the elevator. You go up one floor, and the lounge is there. I thought, Thank you. So I got in the lift. I pressed the button. The doors closed. I went up a floor and the doors didn't open. I thought, I thought what? You know, the lounge was there, and I couldn't get it. I thought, this is ridiculous. So I, I hit the ground floor again, I went, went back down, the doors opened. The woman on the desk sort of looked puzzled. I smiled, I, I pressed the button again, it went up, the doors didn't open. I thought, this is ridiculous. I started hitting the button, they didn't open, so I started hitting the button like this. Then I heard this snigger. The entire business lounge. <laughs> All they'd seen was this. <laughs> it was there, right behind me. The doors were open. But I'd stayed in the lift, thinking I was trapped. Paul saying, can't you see? You're free. There's a new exodus in your life. You're no longer enslaved. Maybe there are things in your life. It's so easy, isn't it? Patterns of behavior that you feel completely, if you're honest, trapped by, like there's no way out. But Jesus has made a way. You're already free. And this freedom is linked to the fact that we are forgiven. Verse 14, it says, he's brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. Now the word redemption there literally means, the root is um, being purchased from the slave market. That's what redemption means. You've been purchased from the slave market. And Jesus has bought you and me with his blood on the cross, which means we are now free people, no longer slaves. And there's great precedent, actually, of that in this country. It's said that in AD 595, the Pope, Pope Gregory the Great, was walking through the streets of Rome, and he saw a slave market. And he turned to the man next to him and said, who are those slaves? And the man said, sire, they are Angles from Britannia. And the Pope said, they're beautiful. And the man said, yes, sire, but they are pagan and the most barbaric of slaves. And it is said that the Pope turned to that man and said, I want you to go and make angels of those angles. And the man to whom he said this, of course, was Saint Augustine of Canterbury, who then got on a boat. He landed on the south coast of England and at a time when this country had known the Dark Ages, he began to advance northwards, re-evangelizing the nation and bringing people through Jesus out of slavery in their hearts into freedom, 
in the kingdom of Jesus. And I believe that's what the Holy Spirit is doing once again in this nation in our time. He's bringing countless people in this city and throughout the country to realize that they have been purchased by Jesus so they can leave that which traps them, enslaves them, and bring them into freedom. Amen? And when we are uh, free, we have to remind ourselves over and over again that that is the case. Because it's so easy to forget. I have a very good friend whose um, father, when he was a young boy, he and his family lived in East Germany. As you know, the Berlin Wall came up and amazingly, he and his family were able to escape over into West Germany. And when they did that, they suddenly transferred from one kingdom to another and they were free. But he said to me once, he said, Miles, you know, it was amazing. He said, it was for a long period of time after that, even though I was in West Germany, he said, whenever I went near the wall, the Berlin Wall, and those East German border guards began to bark commands at me, I would instinctively, out of habit, begin to obey them. He said, I almost had to shake myself to remind myself that actually I didn't need to do that. They no longer had any authority over me. Those powers were no longer over me. I was free. I may be a bit like him. We can think of uh, powers in our life, patterns of behavior that seem to bark commands over us. And we just sort of instinctively follow those commands. But I want us to know today that Actually, we don't have to, because they no long, those powers no longer have any authority over you and me. Only the name of Jesus has authority over us now. And we are free to live that way. And when we realize the forgiveness that comes with freedom, it makes us so thankful. It's the complete opposite of being bitter. I've never met anybody bitter who's thankful, nor anyone thankful who's bitter. So the question is, which do we want to be, better or bitter? And Jesus says we no longer have to be self-enslaved. We're free because he's brought about a new exodus. The second thing that this supreme Jesus brings about in our lives to help us mature in Christ is not just a new exodus, but also he's brought about new creation. It's not that we're just no longer slaves, but we have a completely fresh start in him. Verse 18, Paul writes, he, Jesus, is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Jesus is the beginning, the arche, the source of new creation. And just as the incarnation was the climax of creation, so the resurrection has ushered in the dawn of new creation. God has brought forward the inauguration of the age to come into this world right now to unleash the power of the age to come into the today. So that, oh, let there be light, it's new creation. So that in everything, Paul says, Jesus might have the supremacy. And as the firstborn from amongst the dead, when Jesus rose from the dead, as the firstborn, Jesus inherits everything. There's actually nothing in this world that Jesus can't say, that's mine, or you're mine. He inherits the lot. But amazingly, he chooses to share that inheritance with us. Not because we deserve it, but, but because he loves us. That's why Paul writes in verse 12, 
he has qualified you to share in the inheritance. So I suppose I want to ask us today, do you know your inheritance? Do you know what that looks like? In new creation, your inheritance means a, new, a completely new identity. We are now children of God, co-heirs with the king, with Jesus himself. And it means new power to live holy lives, just as Paul was praying for them at the start of the letter. A new identity, a new power. And this is not just abstract. This is for you and me in the here and now. It's practical. That's why uh, at the start of the letter in verse two, he addresses it to those in Christ at Colossae. He could have just as easily have written to those in Christ at South Kensington. It's for now. You know, uh, here we run, well, Nigel Skelsey runs the recovery course for those struggling with addictions. And other churches have asked, can they run it too? So Nigel went down to a church in Somerset just to do the first session for them to kick it off. And he said that at that first session, uh, uh, there was a man there covered from head to toe in tattoos. And Nigel asked him his name, and he said, my name is Mad Dog. And Nigel said, okay, but what's your real name? At which the man got quite aggressive and said, no, my name is Mad Dog. Okay, Mr. Dog, that's, that's totally fine. And they, they did the, the first session, and Mad Dog explained how he'd recently been released from prison, and uh, he was addicted to drugs and alcohol, and how he hated the church. So Nigel did that first session, then he came back here, and four months later, he went back to that church in Somerset to see how they were doing. It was a Sunday service, and the pastor asked somebody to get up to share their testimony. And Nigel said, to his amazement, who gets up but Mad Dog? And this was his opening line. He said, hello, my name is Phil. Phil? He said, yeah, my name's Phil. And then he went on to explain how since that first session on the course, he hadn't used any drugs or drunk since. And then subsequently, he put his faith in Jesus. And how now with others, he was helping to mentor two other ex-offenders who had just joined that church. And he said, I don't have any family, but this, the church, is now my family. And I have a completely new identity and life in Jesus Christ. That is new creation. Amen. Let's uh, pray. Lord, I thank you that you are supreme and that it is for freedom that you have set us free. And we pray now that as we come to take communion, that we might step into that freedom afresh that we would realize all that we already have in you. And in so doing, Lord, would you mature us into the people you have made us to be. And we pray this in your mighty name, Lord. Amen.